We sat down with Matt Sylvester, a professional painter and illustrator from Vermont. He talks with us about working with various clients, doing book covers, movie posters, page illustrations, and concept art. Along with illustration, Matt paints and exhibits his work in various galleries throughout New England. During this interview, he has given us some great art techniques and professional advice. This advice and techniques are as fit for seasoned art professionals and those eager to make a living through their art. So enjoy the interview. <laughs> All right, so uh, this is episode 12 of Story Comic Presents, and we have here in the uh, we have here in the virtual studio. I, sh I still get hung up. I got to figure out something to say because that's how I always end up saying it. But uh, we have here Matthew Sylvester, who is a painter and illustrator living in central Vermont. And for those that are from Vermont, that means something. And for those that don't live in Vermont, central Vermont means absolutely nothing to you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, and so Matthew here, after earning a, a BFA in fine arts at uh, Maine College of Art in Portland, uh, spent several years uh, working in independent comics. Now he has retired from working in uh, comics and now he uh, does, he continues working with uh, and does uh, uh, illustration and other work for various clients doing book covers, movie posters, uh, concept art. And now he also paints and exhibits a lot of his work in various galleries in New England. So Matthew, <coughs> welcome to uh, welcome to the program. Welcome to the, the <coughs> podcast slash live stream. The show, the man show too, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Yeah. <laughs> this is uh, Stud Muffin Central. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you can't get you can't get two better looking guys in the no. room. Like <laughs> no. <laughs> it could be fates have collided. That's right. So, uh, so for the for the sake of the the audience who might be listening, or also the ones that might be watching, uh, give people a, a bit of a background on on how you how you got to where you are today. Sure, <laughs> I'll try to give you the uh, abbreviated, you know, Cliff Notes life story. Yeah, you were, you were born at a very young age. That's sort of the I story. was. <laughs> Um, yeah, I was, I was born in, uh, I grew up basically in Durham, Maine. Coincidentally enough, uh, that's Stephen King's hometown. Oh, okay. so yeah, he was actually a childhood friend of my dad's, which was kind of interesting, but I didn't get into his books until I was like a teenager. But, um, yeah, I grew up just being interested in things like, you know, uh, Walt Disney, the Peanuts, Mad Magazine and started drawing at a pretty early age. Um, I remember I quit baseball to take art lessons. <laughs> and, you know, I, I know my, probably my dad was just like a little like, oh man, cause he was the coach. <laughs> <laughs> but it was what I really wanted to do, you know? Um, and I think I really started getting into doing artwork for my imagination um, when Star Wars came out when I was 10 and my parents got me the art of Star Wars for Christmas. Okay. And that's when I really put it together. Like, Oh crap. Wow. These people can just put their ideas down and it gets put on screen and they can make their imagination come to life. So that's when I sort of really buckled down and started diving deep into the imagination aspect of it. Oh. Um, High school took as much art as I could, independent study, you know, just, I was actually on, on <laughs> I was gearing towards an engineering possible uh, career, you know, a lot of math, a lot of science, and I shadowed an engineer for two days and I was so bored. <laughs> so that, that sunk the deal for me. It's like, I'm going to art school. <laughs> so uh, yeah, off to Maine College of Art for four years. Um, it, it was a good, I mean, it was a good program. The, you know, you definitely get all your foundation courses, all the drawing, 3D, color. Um, did a double major in painting and printmaking. Um, 
it was interesting back then that college, you know, it was mostly a fine arts college. It was, illustration was kind of a dirty word, <clears throat> believe it or not. But now they have a great illustration program, which is kind of cool. So um, after graduating, I was like, well, got these student loans, I gotta pay them. <laughs> so I basically, I worked at an art store and started managing it at one point. And I also worked as a cook and a chef at a European bistro. And then I did comics. And I did that for like three or four years all together. Um, but that was my initial foray into comic books. So started working for a couple of small independent companies. Um, actually, the guy came in to get supplies and uh, I was like, oh, well, what do you need it for? And he's like, oh, we do comics. I'm like, oh, really? Well, I'm an artist. He's like, well, send us some samples. And so I sent some samples and he's like, hey, I got just the book for you. And uh, so that sort of started my career there. Um, it was a huge learning curve too, because I hadn't done sequential art. And as you know, and I'm sure a lot of people do, it's, you know, making sure everything has a continuity to it. And um, but it was, it was fun at the start as, as I went on in the years, things got busy cause I was an art director at one and doing art another. And sometimes it'd be like, Oh, this convention's coming up. We need you to pencil and ink this book in two weeks. <laughs> oh, and that was okay. I jammed on it for certainly a couple of years and going to conventions was fun. And um, the art director part was cool too, because you got to meet a lot of different artists. And, um, but one of the people that I worked for, he, uh, do you know who Dick Ayers is? The name sounds familiar. Yeah, he was one of the original Marvel guys. He, you know, he worked with Jack Kirby. He did like Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos, X-Men. Okay. He came to a convention that we put on. He and his wife showed up. He was like in this like really cool green seersucker suit. I picked them up at the airport at like midnight. And uh, he and his wife was like, they're like, is there a bar that's open where we can get a, you know, a beer and something to eat? You know, he was like 70. Yeah. Really cool guy. And we got talking and spent time hanging out at the convention and he saw some of my airbrush work that I had done. So he was working on a, a book called Chiron for this guy. I think it was licensed to be made into a movie by Fox or something, but never happened. But he's like, would you airbrush my covers for me? And I was like, Oh yeah. <laughs> like I don't even need any money. I'll, you know, I'll do this. No problem. So I think I had gotten the second one airbrushed and the guy who was running the whole show had our work and was going to show it to some people. He did conventions too. Didn't hear from him for a while. And so I called uh, Dick and said, Hey, you know what's going on? He's like, no, I haven't heard anything to you. He's like, I basically pencils and ink four books and don't know what's going on. So come to find out this, guy had some huge financial problems and skipped town with like all of my portfolio, oh, no. all the artwork. Um, so yeah, at that point I'm like, I don't want to work for somebody else and have this happen. Right. So that's sort of when I move more towards the illustration end and um, sort of like a gun for hire, like, and I did a few more comics, uh, weird things. Like there was one Exxon was trying to clear up its name after one of their big spills back in the early nineties. Yeah. <laughs> so they had this idea for the sea babies. <laughs> so yeah, I worked on some odd things like that. And another title, it was these brothers that were dentists. They were make it was called Kempo commandos. <laughs> <laughs> But, but it was fun, but I, I kind of got burnt out at the end and, and realized that I was more interested in doing like, uh, you know, one shot paintings and cover art. And so sort of pulled up stakes and moved to Vermont to caretake a house and just sort of tucked into that for a while. Yeah. Um, so was it, what, what was the, the piece that kind of made you uh, 
what was do you think was it def- was it that defining moment of when uh some you know the guy skipped out of town with your portfolio or that or was it the <clears throat> the timeline and like the the stress of getting the work done or was it a combination of both it was definitely a combination of those things don't get me wrong my hats off to anybody who does sequential work and it, you know there's some really amazing artists and they do a great job at it but i realized it wasn't quite the thing for me especially because i you know you've seen a lot of my work i'm pretty meticulous about what i do in detail oriented and just the hours were <laughs> were ungodly and you know the tra- traveling and back then shows were different they weren't as big as they are now with a lot of the cosplay and stuff so it was like you'd go all day and then you'd hunker down in your hotel room and you'd be you know penciling or inking and it, it just it started to take the the joy out of it you know like the fun right so and it's funny because it's like oh yeah i want to be in comics so bad you know i i was totally into x-men and everything else and um, but yeah, that, it, it just wasn't working for me anymore, but great experience. Yeah. Definitely. If you want to, it instilled in me, like if I'm hired to do something and I have a timeline, I stick to it. It would definitely taught me how to put my nose to the grindstone. And, right. Yeah. So was that something that you were able to take away from that would be uh, from the work that you did is that it kind of instilled you that kind of the, that work ethic that did you have before, before that? Yeah, I, I already kind of had that in me um, from art school, mm-hmm. you know, going to art college, that's, you're more left on your own and it, it was, I don't know. I just got caught up in it. Right. Um, but it was also art school is a little bit, you know, for me, it was a little bit confusing too, because like I said, illustration was sort of a, a dirty word at that time. Like no one considered illustrators as fine artists. So I, I kind of, <laughs> I remember being in a critique of all my paintings and whatever. And, I always, you know, I had a lot of ideas. So there was always paintings about ideas, you know. It wasn't figure studies. It wasn't still lives. It was like these ideas I had. And there were monsters. And there were like, you know, dark bridges with strange figures on them. And just things. So someone finally asked me, like, what are you doing here? Like, why are you here? (laughs) And I was like, I wanted to get a better skill set so I could be, you know, the best illustrator I could be. Right. And everybody was pissed. My teacher was, my instructor was pissed. And some of the, my fellow people in my painting building were like, like upset at me. And I was kind of chucked in the doghouse. <laughs> it was, it was one of the strangest things in my life. Right. Um, they thought that I was belittling what was being taught to me. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's funny because there yeah. was a situation when I had when I was uh when I was in uh art school. It's yeah, you're right. It's like now that I've kind of had that now I'm kind of realizing the same thing. When I was in art school, I had a lot of my friends that were doing media production and I had mm-hmm. a lot of friends that were uh, you know g- g- getting taking science classes and they were they were working in classes that were teaching you, okay, this is how you you know, work in the real life where like fine art is like, this is how, and like you said, it's about, it's about, you know, honing your craft and, and, but yeah, you're right. In the fine art section, they don't really teach you how to have a job doing it. It's almost like it's a bad thought to want to make <laughs> money off of it. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. I mean, luckily there was a, a guy named uh, Al Gardner. He was a printmaker and he was my saving grace. He was, he was this Mainer who really talented and kind of took me under his wing and just, you know, he sort of pulled me through all those troubled times and like pushed me in a direction that was appropriate for me. So, right. You know, 
So how, and your, your artwork is really interesting in the sense um, your artwork is pretty interesting in the sense that it has this uh, kind of a, I don't want to say the word macabre, but there is this, there's a, and it's funny because you're, it's like, <laughs> it reminds me, like some of my friends that listen to like, you know, like that kind of the music they listen to this like dark music, but they're like the nicest people in the world. And it's interesting, like your, your art style, uh, how did, where did you get your art style in the sense that it, your, your passion of drawing these, these kind of these dark kind of like horror horror images that are are not they're not i would put this they're not scary but they're engaging they really create they right. kind of pull something out of the back of your you know the back of your imagination of you right. know the fun the fun imagination of the monster in the closet kind of situations yeah yeah for sure so um, where did you yeah where did this how long have you been what's your inspiration behind this I mean, I mean, like I talked about earlier, is definitely, you know, tapping into the imagination, like pulling those things that are in your head and, and bringing them forward. And, you know, I was always looking at people like, you know, Ralph McGuire, Bernie Wrightston, Frank Frazetta. Um, I was reading Stephen King books. I was into horror movies. In high school, I had a job at a video store and just, you know, <laughs> watched way too many horror films. Um, but I've always been attracted to images that sort of tell a story without spelling everything out. Um, you're, I, I think the, the best images are ones where you look at it in your head, you start making your own story. I haven't told you what you are looking at. I've given you an idea. I've given you some things to sort of engage you. And hopefully you create the story behind that. Right. Um, and sometimes it's like you don't reveal everything. Maybe there's a dark figure in the corner. Maybe there's, well, you know, you got that print behind you. The, you know, we can talk about that later. Um, I try to leave something up to the imagination. Mm -hmm. You know, not, it's, oh, here it, it's a, woman with a chainsaw and a bathing suit, you know, fighting zombies, you know, there, there's a, there's some background to that. I think of, you know, Stephen King was a big influence, his writing. Um, very, I don't know, you know, when you read a Stephen King book, he's not very flowery with language. He uses common words that we all use every day, but he weaves them so well that you get this really strong picture in your mind. Right. Um, and also I think too, you know, I was definitely influenced. I love movies. So that was, I, that's how most of my images happen is I'm playing like this, this movie in my head of this thing that I think of. And as the movie's going, I'll freeze a frame. Right. It seems to be how I've always come up with images. I don't know why it's that way, but I think just a kid growing up. I mean, I originally wanted to be a special effects artist right. as a kid, but just didn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, like one of you, so like one, a couple of the, the prints that I have of yours, you know, and this is the one here was, is, uh, I really liked it a lot. I remember when I was one of your, uh, I was across, or was it from behind you or something at one of the conventions? And cause I got, I got two girls and you got a, you got a daughter. I do. And, and the, yeah. And that's, and you tell me this was kind of inspired. This is the model is that you did of your, of your daughter. Correct. Right. Right. Do you want me to pull it up on screen with that? Yeah. If you want to yeah, go ahead and pull it up on screen and then we can kind of narrate it to those that might be listening later. We'll see if we can make this work. Uh, let me. Bop -bop. All right. Hang on, folks. All right. Can you see it okay? Yeah. Okay. Yep, we can see it. Boom. Um, yeah, it was, I think my daughter was probably about nine at the time, maybe eight. And we would make up like stories during her bedtime. It'd be like a continuing story or we'd make up a new one. And we got talking about 
this one, she had a couple of stuffed animals, uh, Tinkle Bear and Murphy. And he had this duct tape hat that she made with tiger, <laughs> tiger print. But it was talking about a girl's imagination that is so strong that when she falls asleep, it becomes a reality. So we talked about like, oh, what happens if the wall, you know, the wall would dissolve away and all of a sudden you're in the middle of this war and you're fortified in your bunk bed. And that's where this whole image came from. And, you know, instead of you seeing her in the, these fighting the monsters or whatever it is, you don't see them. They're not part of the frame. You know, mm-hmm. that's sort of, going to leave that up to the imagination. Like what the hell's going on? (laughs) Um, And she also wanted to be what she wanted to. She's like, when you draw me, can you sort of draw me when I'm 13? So that was, that was kind of interesting. Just uh, figuring out, you know, when people are younger, their faces are much smoother and rounder. Right. And as you grow older, a little bit more angulation, you know, jaw lines and change and eyes change a little bit and, you know, a little bit more muscular structure. It was kind of a fun exercise to think of things like that. How close did you get? I pretty much nailed it. It's kind of bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> we, were, we were looking back at it not too long ago, maybe about a year ago, and I kind of nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, it's, uh, because what I mean, what we're looking at here, it's uh, kind of. Can you kind of describe it for us? Yeah, like I said, it's her, her stuffed animals sort of taking action. Um, you don't see what's happening on the uh, the right side of the screen, and you can see that there's some arrows that have hit. There's one that's burning in the bed, so it's coming from somewhere. Right. Um, so they're they're getting ready to fight. Fight what? I don't know. <laughs> um, it re- yeah. yeah, it reminds me a lot of this whole, like this, yeah, this whole, this whole idea of, you know, like, yeah, children's imaginations just take on the world of their own. And, right. and that, you know, and it's, and I love that, I love the look of it's, of the stuffed animals are, you know, alive and they're helping fight off whatever is happening. And she's got that bow and arrow drawn and, uh that boat yeah that is i i I loved it when i saw that i just said yeah this is an amazing well thank you yeah it was it it was a it was a definitely a piece of endearment for sure and yeah um yeah it's sort of uh it was one of my first big digital pieces like complete digital pieces i was just starting to play around with digital art so so you did this from you didn't draw this out this is all by no hand. well all on the computer since we're here let's use right. the magic of the interwebs <laughs> um so basically it started out as a pencil okay which you can see and then eventually you know the uh the pencil goes to pen and ink so was this done digitally or no this was um i still really enjoy using traditional medium i love the feel of a pencil i love right pen and ink um and then you scan it and then turn it to like a, a digital render a black and white digital render okay um and then from there you can start blocking in colors um And this is where I, you know, it was a good lesson because you had to figure out like, oh, how do you create, you know, clipping masks and masks so that each thing has its own layer and you don't, when you're painting over it, you don't bleed out into the next um, figure or object. And Um, are you you using Adobe for this or? Yeah, Adobe Photoshop, sometimes Painter. Okay. Um, And you can see just, you know, I start by blocking in big areas of color and then go in and start adding like some softness and texture. And so that'd be a little bit more progress. 
So that's you still have some of those as a fl some flats on there. Yeah. yeah, here and in the bed. Yeah. Um, and that's when you start thinking about things like like in the finished piece. Um, you know, you can see that in the bed, putting in the shadows, but there's also you got to be aware of like ambient light. Right. You know, light bouncing off the floor. Um, light from this arrow hitting the back of her arm. What happens with shadows? You know, it, it's a. Uh, it gets pretty involved after a while. Now that. I'm <laughs> um, so yeah, you just you start with the basic blocks, and then you slowly start adding detail, and then as more detail comes, and that's when you can start thinking about how light affects the situation. And it was it's a little difficult because you have, you have to have the overall lighting situation, which is sort of flooding the whole picture, which was the idea there's some sort of doorway or something off to the right. And then you got to start thinking about how that affects all the other little light sources like the fire burning and reflected light. And yeah, it's, um, well, and also too, it's like when you compare it to what you're talking about earlier with like sequential art, where you're telling a story through, you know, like several panels, maybe, you know, a minimum of four, but you're, you're telling it an entire story in one picture, which is right, which is, uh, in a way, in some cases, way more complicated. Because you allow, because what you're doing is that you're allowing, you're allowing the viewer to, to create more of the story or infer more where instead of leading somebody across, you know, through several panels to tell the story that you want to tell, you allow, you're allowing the viewer to uh, come up with their own story and you give them enough right. background. I mean, even, even looking at, even looking at how it's set up with even the door frame itself says to me, this is an older house. This isn't, right. it actually has that, that new England colonial, look to it as well yeah i mean those those are important details you know those that's um that's her room right. um i do you know i do uh, i don't have the photographs for this but i do take reference photos for and work and it and we can look at some some of that right uh that got set up later but yeah it, it is difficult it, you know i mean a lot of sketching goes into one image because like you said you're trying to tell a story by just one panel. Right. Yeah. And so let me ask you the question though, is like in, in your, in your foot, in your photograph reference, was there the, the dog leash hanging on the doorknob or was that, was that another deliberate thing you added into the picture just to create more of a story? Um, that was something I th threw in there because, you know, if, if you actually, you know, put your hand in front of that and take it out, it really, oh, that okay. whole background becomes sort of dead and flat. Okay. But it's also a little piece of something she used to, she always wanted a dog. And so she had this stuffed dog that she had a leash for. Oh, that's cool. And she'd walk it around. And uh, right. so that it's just like one of those little things that tells a tiny bit of a story. Right. And, you know, even up in here, there's this little tiny piece of her favorite blanket hanging down. <laughs> And those only I will know, but right, you know, it, 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 who knows? Maybe it was just a little time capsule for myself or something. Right. Um, so yeah, so that's that image. And it, and it, and it fits. And like, and I think you'll uh, you'll if you can show us a, a, a few more of your images too. Is that it? It does sure. fit within your theme of of. Um, not telling the the whole story deliberately not telling the whole story right. it, wasn't it wasn't it um alfred hitchcock who said that the people some people's imagination is a lot scarier than what you can produce um, yes yeah. so he he allowed people to imagine more and that's what made hitchcock even scarier no that's true um i was trying to think of something do you want something with cons you know like photographs well yeah but i love well look at the your your zombie dinosaur that's a really that actually is 
Let's open that. Well, interesting enough, it all started with this drawing, um, which was a conversation between that uh, something Joe Citro had brought up on Facebook. He's like, why hasn't anybody done any movies or anything about zombie dinosaurs? <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's cool. And so I did this little sketch. Um, I, I think I was going to put more stuff in there like, it, you know, zombie dinosaur breaks up a cocktail party or something. <laughs> um, so later on, it turned into me. I kept thinking about it and over and over in my head, I'm thinking of the movie again. And like, what if you're being chased by one of these things? And it eventually ended up uh, me being pinned I'll show you the reference photos pinned up on the top of a car. <laughs> oh, okay. Is that so, you? That's me. <laughs> or did you ask your wife to take the picture? She or? stood on the porch and took a picture. Uh, Cause it's a, it's a funky angle, you right. know? And I think there's even a more de this was, I like this pose better. Okay. So this would be something that I, I didn't have the dinosaur obviously. Right. So <laughs> I had to make that up. But yeah, I'll take photographs. Um, I think one thing sometimes it's missing in comics is when you look at a comic, it has this sameness to it. And p these amazing people are always drawing from their muscle memory and having drawn a character a million times. Right. Um, but for me, I, I always felt like there was a little something missing like that realistic authenticity, like all those subtle things that happen with strange angles and just those little things that you miss. The only reason I know that because when I would draw sequential art and not look at any reference and then go back and look at something, I'd be like, Oh, Oh no. You, you tend to stylize and make things up. Um, so I just like real reference for me because I want it to be super grounded in reality, even though it's a, a comic style piece of work. That's um, amazing. And I, I just wonder what, the, what was your wife thinking? Says, hey, honey, can I, can you, can you take a picture of me standing up on top of the car? I need to draw a picture of a zombie dinosaur. She, she's actually, she's one of my main models. You know, she's, uh, she's posed uh, for, for horrible mon disfigured monsters like hey honey can i see your hands um she's posed for a few paintings so she was she's great i mean she's super supportive and she's like sure <laughs> you know i i definitely i definitely like hit the lottery when i met her for sure um you know she doesn't think it's weird or bizarre she's like yeah that's what you need let's do it <laughs> um Anyway, so yeah, again, it becomes a more detailed pencil. Right. Um, and then it goes to a black and white. And did you do this digitally? Um, the pencil, pen and ink, traditional by right. hand. And then this is the digital render, which I would start adding color to eventually. And then this is the color. Um, and <laughs> like it always happens with me, um, let me just pull it. I, I totally, I mean, you know, you look at this thing, you see the, see the tree reflection right. in the windshield. I even broke the windshield. Like I ran up there and I started putting in footprints and, <laughs> you know, mud, the spray of the mud. Right. It just after a while, I really, <laughs> I really have to tell myself to calm down. Okay. And you know, that personally, that's the, uh, the one problem that I'd like to go back and solve with this piece is like, there's all this unbelievable detail on the vehicle, <laughs> all the reflections and, but I could have pulled that more into maybe the dinosaur a little bit more and over here and maybe just done something a little bit more in the background. Anyway. Um, so how did you do, so was all of this, the details you put in, was that digital? That's digital, yeah. The, um, 
Yeah, the trees, you know, the trees and stuff, those are things you can, I sort of drew in there. Um, okay. I experimented for the first time. I made a few of my own brushes, like by taking pictures of clouds. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, like these down here are drawn in clouds. And this was like a cloud brush that I had made. I'm like, oh, let's try it. It works. Um, the glass breaking, that was, I think that was just, I basically made a large bunch of uh, hash marks and made a quick stamp for that. Um, so again, this is a good experimental piece is when I was learning Photoshop and all the things you could do with it. And do you, when you do, when you use Photoshop, are you using like a mouse or are you using like the, like a, a pen, one of the. Yeah, I have, um, I have a, like a large Wacom. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. And then a, a good old pen okay. and it, it's great. It's, you know, it's not on the screen, but it's a good, uh, it's a good hand eye. Right. You get used to it really quick. Right. Um, so that was, and then since we're on this kick, um, I, th I think as an artist, you should always challenge yourself. And there was a guy named Kieran Yanner. He's a concept artist and worked for Magic the Gathering. And he was saying he did a lot of things like you just saw. I have like one or two figures in a piece, but he's like, I've never done something with five or six. And I was like, oh my God, neither have I. Well, you know, that would be a challenge. So um, I, you probably remember this piece. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I challenged myself <laughs> with a multiple figure piece. Um, and this was, a nut, this was where I learned the most about Photoshop because it's just, there's so much nutty detail. Um, and again, we'll, we'll, let's use my lovely wife. I would take reference photos. Um, I even took reference photos at the same angle of, you know, various objects that I was going to fill. Right. Because that's a, that's, I mean, it's, it's such a strange angle. Right. And do you do that on purpose trying to find really bizarre angles so yep. that you can kind of practice on that? Okay. Right. Because like, you know, like I said earlier, you'll see like a zombie piece and it's, you know, someone from an up view with their chainsaw and the zombies reaching up from down below. Um, so I try to find ways to interject a different perspective just to make the piece more interesting. Um, and also it's that, it's Would you? I, I just gotta. Did you like tell your? Listen, I need to take. We need to at least drink four beers so we can yeah. have those. Empty. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, we had a good old time. She was she was right hammered when she posed for that one. No, she, she actually, honestly, she just got home from work. She just came from the hospital, and I was like, "Honey, can you put a bandage? Hold this gun." And. um but it was, it, it fed into the story later. Right. Um, I was trying to think like what would be, a, I always loved uh, Dawn of the Dead and there's that scene when they're on top of the mall and all the zombies. Mm -hmm. So the, the fifth year of uh, Art of Horror was coming up. So I wanted to do something with some people trapped on top of the Art of Horror building in you know, the soda factory, space gallery. Um, with zombies out in the parking lot and you know there's always the military men or something like well what about women because right. you know no one you don't think of women as often inflicting this type of violence and I don't want to do the you know bikini thing and the over sexualized so I thought the story would be more interesting what about these four women are sort of put together in this situation from different backgrounds and they're having to do this thing to survive. Right. Um, so my wife, who's, you know, she's a caretaker. I tried to put in her body language that 
you know, working in the medical industry, this probably weighs pretty heavy on her, having to dispatch these people who used to be human. Um, this is my niece, Emily, mm -hmm. who was in college at the time, a little apprehensive, you know, just going out into the world. Uh, do you know Beth Robinson? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Strange Dolls, um, you know, leather jacket, that, you know, it's just type of person she is, you know, just sort of like rock and roll chick going to get business done. And this is our friend over here, Jocelyn. She's a, she's hiked the long trail multiple times. So I feel like, you know, she could definitely be a survivor too. And then, so yeah, just putting all these women in this situation. Well, it's funny too, because just looking at it from like a Vermont perspective, they all kind of seem to represent, you know, some aspects of like Vermont, you know, culture in a way too. Yeah, absolutely. And was the bow and arrow, is that, is that kind of like a throwback, almost like an homage to your, to the, the picture, the illustration you showed us earlier as well? Yeah, a, a little bit. And it's also reflective of the type of person that Emily is, you know, she's, she's a very, you know, kind, uh, giving spirit you know she loves animals and i thought the bow and arrow would just be more of a more it's the most humane weapon i can think of if that's you know um so the you know the i tried intentionally to make things reflective of the people that are there um and uh, this actually inspired, there's a, a writer, his name's Tom Carnell, he's a horror writer, and he actually uh, wrote a short story based on it. And it was really interesting, it's called Sorority. Uh -huh. um, but it, it was a totally kind of different take on how I had thought of it, which I love because that's the idea, you know, what's, what's the story that someone pulls out of what I've presented to them, so. Mm. And then, of course, you know, the fun with the zombies. Um, well, you know, there's Michael Jackson. I saw that one. Yeah. Crossing guard. There's a woman in curlers. Oh, there she is. A guy with one of those weird bear hats. You know, it's just, it, it was a fun piece. The wedding couple. Um, yeah, anyway. <laughs> so I, to talk to us about <clears throat> the, uh, the actual... Um, the method you put this together because you showed us you put you had the photographs there right right i got sidetracked <laughs> um i don't have the pencil drawing but i have it went for, it was a pencil drawing then it became an ink drawing okay pen and ink over all this then scan it um and then once it's scanned you basically get rid of the white background and you just have your line drawing right um, and then it was uh, meticulously starting to block. Let's see, I got some color blocking going on. Yeah. Start right. blocking in big areas again. Right. Um, try to get the local color. And you also have to be thinking too, um, there has to be like an overall color sensation when you get done it has to have a, a cohesive feel so planning that out you know making sure the red's not like too fire engine red right and sticks out too much um uh what do we get this one of them and is that something you think you kind of learned through just just a visual eye or is that something that you you were it, learned well, at art school art school years of painting yeah you know, just doing, you know, that's how you're going to, anything you do, you know, you put your 10,000 hours in or, or plus, as right. you know, you know, you, you get better in, in these instincts start popping up. And actually this lesson uh, at the time I was taking a figure drawing group uh, once a week. And there was a guy named Billy Brower. Um, he passed away not too long ago, but he's a really excellent uh, figurative artist and excellent painter. He was in his seventies teaching this class and he would, he would get on me. And uh, this was some of the lessons I learned for him was, you know, even, you know, even 
at my age, there's still some lessons to be learned or old lessons to, to bring back to the forefront. And, um, you know, I, I think if you're going to be an artist and you're going to be, want to still be excited about art and keep doing it, you know, you got to look, you got to f- be a perpetual student, mm. you know, challenge yourself, do something you're uncomfortable with, take yourself out of the comfort zone. Cause that's the only way you're, you know, you're going to grow and move forward. I, I mean, I, unfortunately, you know, I, I run into people who are really talented and they're sort of like stuck in this static spot and, you know, it's just, no, that's my style. That's just the way I do it. It's too bad because there's that potential for growth. So, you know, why not take yourself out of the, your comfort zone? It's, you might be doing some sucky art for a little bit, but I think what you're going to gain on the back end, right. it's pretty valuable. Well, I mean, you, 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 you expand your toolbox by learning some other. For sure. Yeah. 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 Um, and then, of course, you get to the final. That's a huge jump, though. Right. <laughs> I think I got halfway through doing a lot of these figures, and I was like, why am I doing this? So you did this. So this, you did this before your dinosaur one. Your dinosaur one was 2014, 2015. Yeah, the dinosaur one was more of a that was sort of a quicker thing for a show. Right. Um, What were some of the things that you learned from Photoshop on this picture that you were able to translate, that you were able to carry forward on your, your dinosaur illustration? It it was just basically learning the basic tools. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the, I expanded my knowledge on masking things off, keeping things, separated making sure i had uh you know the right color layer settings and it's just all those little tiny technical things i made some of my own brushes that were um i think we can expand a little bit you know so the brushes have a, you can see they're a little bit more painterly mm-hmm. in their strokes um i i kind of like that for me in digital art right so but um and this goes again into what you're talking about your theme of showing more and not and letting you know letting the viewer's imagination kind of take over right right exactly um since it's here let's just pull up um this thing for this is a more this is a traditional oil painting Mm -hmm. um it was for a book called cover for a book called evil angel um the idea it started out as like this quick color sketch this is what the the writer wanted i wasn't super psyched about this centralized idea it was kind of not exciting for Mm -hmm. me so what i what it eventually turned into cue the my friend mike posing in the cellar (laughs) um and then me doing another color check for the red um so basically i'll you can see i'll draw right on the the board or whatever um and then just start sketching in local areas of color sort of to me there's nothing more intimidating than a white canvas so i like to i like to get it thrown down as quick as possible and get rid of the white right and then once you got the local color down you can start um you just it's almost like a sculptor you know you're just sort of starting to refine each area bring the colors together. Um, Oh, I got to start thinking about the translucency of the wing. That's not going to work because there was too much dark in one area. So you make something up to sort of help frame the wing out a little more, you you know, 
all these multiple things you got to think about in a painting. And then also the overall design. Uh, how do you make something that's right in the middle of the cover, which is what the, the uh, writer wanted, um, interesting? And that's when you, I, you, know, you use these devices like the shadow makes a large triangle, mm. sort of pulls you in. And then you have these little cords hanging from, uh, coming from the ceiling and all these elements that sort of pull you in. Right. Um, and like I said, you know, I still really enjoy traditional painting and drawing. And I think, like you said, it's, it's part of having this large toolbox. I think if you're going to be, you know, an, an illustrator, an artist in general, having it, the, the bigger your toolbox, the more options you're going to have. Right. So. So, yeah, so that's that. So what were some of your, what were some of your inspirations? Like who you meant, you mentioned, a, uh, you mentioned an artist earlier. Who do you, who's your go-to? Who's the one that will say, I bet so-and-so probably figured this out. Let me look at some of their stuff. Or what are some of the ones that kind of spark your imagination and start moving? You mentioned Stephen King earlier, but what about like some visual artists? Um, early on, it was definitely Ralph McGuire who did a lot of the production paintings for Star Wars. Oh, okay. um, yeah you'll i'm sure you'd recognize them as soon right. as you saw them um definitely you know frazetta was there for sure um you know ken kelly he did things like the kiss cover and okay you know uh but also i, I like norman rockwell mm -hmm. you know painters like that um so those were some of the early I mean, you know, we could, the list can certainly get like larger and longer. Um, yeah, I mean, e even though all the, all the classical artists that I was exposed to, right. you know, someone like Bierstadt or those Hudson River Schoolers, the, yeah. the pre-Raphaelites. Yeah, Ro I was going to say, Daniel yeah. Gabriel Rossetti is yep. like, yeah, that's some of your, there you go. your lights yeah. remind me of that a lot. Yeah, yeah. The lighting. You know, the dramatic lighting of like Caravaggio, mm -hmm. those really scary <laughs> time <laughs> paintings. <laughs> um, so I drew a lot from those, but I think it's good, you know, for me, it's good to put those things away and just sort of like dig deep into what you're doing. Right. Um, Cause it's hard, you know, it's, it's hard not to be influenced by somebody. Right. Um, it, you know, it, you, how many people paint like, you know, like Frazetta, there's a lot of Frazetta like artists that you've seen, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It just wasn't, I don't know. just wasn't my, Right. the direction I wanted to go. So I tried to leave myself alone with me as much as possible, <laughs> <laughs> but not being afraid of being critiqued. I mean, I sought people out and uh, heard some things that I could either, you know, like gotten really upset or sad about or buckle up, buttercup and do it. You know? <laughs> I think, you know, being able to take criticism and always get fresh eyes on your work is pretty valuable for sure. Is so. that part, is that, is that, a, a, is that part of your advice? So because I think you were segueing into my next question is what for people wanting to go into illustration and learn more about that and try to, you know, make a go, uh, make that into a career and make it into a, a viable, you know, viable work. What would be some of your advice that you wish somebody told you when you first started? Well, <laughs> why are you bringing out the big guns? <laughs> um, I think I wish, wish somebody was like, would have told me to stick to my guns, you know, Pursue the things that interest you. 
what makes you excited about doing the work that you do. Don't, you know, definitely don't try to be like anybody else. I, like I said, art school was a big learning curve for me because I tried to fall in with the crowd a little bit and it just wasn't me. Um, it didn't feel right. I think, uh, I don't know what I, th I think if someone would have told me to be a little bit better, you know, what criticism, you know, criticism isn't there to belittle you. Uh, it, you know, it's there basically to show you where you need work. It's so valuable because you can start filling in those holes and it's, you know, it's going to make your growth curve that much more exponential. And also, I think, um, make a lot of mistakes and be okay with that. Mistakes are your, honestly, you know, they're like kind of your biggest teacher and your best friend. You know, every mistake you make, you're not going to carry that over into the next piece of work. Mm. You know, you're sort of, you're sort of, uh, chipping away at those holes in your skill set. Um, and I think I, I, someone just play more, you know, don't be so serious about every single, I mean, it's hard when you have a client or you're doing something for someone, but play a little bit more. Yeah. That's kind of what I'm doing now later in life. Yeah. I wish I would have done it sooner, but that's okay. I mean, <laughs> I'm having fun. So, <laughs> Yeah. And I didn't know it then, but now I do is like it, it expand your toolbox. I mean, you know, do as many things as you can and try things. And if, if you don't like it, then you just don't do it again. You know, you know, start turn a few pots on a wheel. If you don't like it, don't do it. Um, try watercolor. If it, after a while, it's not your thing. That's okay. You gave it a shot. I just think having all that stuff in your available, right? It, they they will definitely feed each other. Right. You know, just enjoy. Be a student. Mm. I, I a person. I don't know about you, but I know at this age, I love learning new things. I like doing new things, things that are different. It, it just it sort of frees you up when you have that mindset. You know, you don't have to be the master or the best. You're still learning. You're still pulling in information. There's people that can teach you things. Yeah. Wow. Uh, That's good. Well, hey, well, we, uh, we got a minute left. So this was a quick hour. So Wow. <laughs> <laughs> we burned uh, through that sucker. I know. See, uh, any, uh, where, can, where can people find you? Where can people find your work? Um, you can find me uh, MatthewSylvesterArt.com or Matthew Sylvester Art on Instagram, uh, Facebook, same thing, just Matthew Sylvester Art. Okay. All right. Um, well, not on the Twitter sphere, though. Not yet. You don't tweet. You're on Tumblr, though. I saw that you have a, do you still have a, how active are you on Tumblr? Not, I don't, <laughs> is there anybody really active anymore on Tumblr? <laughs> I heard it was the thing back in the day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, Matt. I appreciate it. And it was, uh, and I think that we got some, we got some good advice from you and we got some good techniques from you. And uh, well, hopefully it wasn't too boring. You know, sometimes I don't know when to shut up and <laughs> it's just, you know, being cooped up. It's just so nice to talk to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks All right. so much, Matt. You bet, Barney. Thanks so much. I remember there was this, this kid in high school, he was kind of a badass. And I had done like this 2D project, but it was like this three panel thing of Bruce Lee or something. And uh, he stole it. <laughs>
And I remember sitting down across from him and he, he looked at me and he's like, you know, I stole that Bruce Lee picture you did, don't you? And I'm like, Oh, it was you. And he's like, he's like, yeah, he's like, that was really awesome. I really liked it. And I was like, one, I was, <laughs> I was not going to start trouble with this guy. And two is like, Hey, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> it was so funny.